Welcome to Bible Insights with Wayne Conrad. God's Word brings light and it imparts understanding to the simple. Today's topic is God, the Immortal One, or the Immortal God. Or as the ancient Christian hymn says, Holy, Immortal God. Holy, Mighty, Immortal One. God is the immortal God. What do we mean by this term? We need to really understand what this term is because it applies, strictly speaking, only to God in a unique and underived sense. Although it is sometimes used in a derived sense to refer to something not quite immortal, but meaning everlasting life at a certain point. We'll get to that. First, let's hear the word of God. Let's hear the scripture itself. First, if you want to praise God, there is no better way to praise him than to take the words of scripture in which God reveals who he is, declares his name, and declares something about his nature and something about his works, and turn it back to God by speaking it into his presence, by speaking it to him, by saying to him such things as to the king of the ages, Immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's found in 1 Timothy 1.17. Or if we want to know the true meaning of the word immortal as used in the scriptures, we should look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. Beginning at verse 13, we have the context. But let me read it to you. In more than one translation, because sometimes there's just a little change and it may help Some of us understand something a little better than the other way of expressing it in English. First, I command you, Paul writes to Timothy, in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and Christ Jesus, who testifies the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you observe the commandment without fault, irreproachable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will make known in his own time, the blessed and only sovereign, the king of those who reign as kings and lord of those who rule as lords, to one who alone possesses immortality, who lives in unapproachable light, whom no human being has seen nor is able to see, to whom be honor and eternal power. Amen. Notice the description given to God. God is one who is the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and eternal power. Well, here is the translation from the Holman Christian Standard, which I think clarifies some things for us, because it could be that the phraseology refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, or that it refers uh, to God. Well, more directly, it refers to God because at the beginning of the context in verse 13, Paul writes, I command you in the sight of God who gives life. And then he talks about Christ. And then he ends with this, who, who alone possesses immortality, who lives in unapproachable life. So that's a reference back to God, to God himself, to God the Almighty. Here's the way the Holman Christian Standard translates this verse in verse 15. God will bring this about in his own time. That is the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the only one who has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light. No one has seen or can see him. To him be honor and eternal might. Amen. Now, that primarily describes God in the essence of his being as we express God the Father. He is the invisible God. No eye ever sees the invisible God the Father. What we see with God is the manifestation of God in the person of his Son, the Word made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And even the Holy Spirit is invisible. It's only the Word who became flesh through the incarnation of Jesus, through the womb of the Virgin Mary, 
that God is manifested in a visible form to us. Now, that doesn't mean that God cannot manifest himself in some kind of temporary visual apprehension, because he did do that in the Old Testament. But we do not see God in the flesh, except for the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will see him at the return and the eternal state is set up. But notice that the attribute of immortality is given to God alone. It says to the one who alone possesses immortality. So it's very important then that we understand the meaning of the term immortal. Because sometimes even Christians use this term unwisely. I think they are trying to express a Christian truth, but in so doing, they, in an essence, sort of hijack a term that should only be applied to God in its direct sense and only used sparingly of man in the eternal state after the resurrection from the dead. What I mean by that? That some of the creeds have in them that man has an immortal soul. We never find that in Scripture. Because the Bible itself says in Ezekiel 18, the soul that sins, it shall die. And you see, the very meaning of the word immortal is one not subject to death, one that is deathless, incorruptible, impossible of any kind of decay, any kind of negative. That's the meaning of immortality because mortal carries the concept of being subject to death. When we say, I'm a mortal, it means I'm one who is subject to death and who will ultimately die. And when our Lord Jesus Christ was incarnate, he took to himself, it was a sinless body, he had a sinless nature, but he had the human body after the fall. That is a human body subject to sickness, subject to decay, subject to death. He had to have this kind of body in order to die. The immortal one took on mortality in the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he could be the sacrifice for our sins. That truth is plainly taught to us in Psalm 40 and also as it's echoed in Hebrews chapter 10. We're putting into the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate state. He says, a body have you prepared for me. It's not in the sacrifices and offerings of animals that you are pleased, but a body you prepared for me. The idea is that God has prepared a body of the incarnation for the word, and God the Son will offer up that body as a sacrifice for sins. And that's what he did on the cross of Calvary. But you see, on the third day, he rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, the body of mortality that he had had was now the immortal body of his resurrection glory. And this is the terminology found in the New Testament that describes Jesus as the firstborn from the dead. But let me go back and just speak with you briefly about the concept of the immortality of God. Certainly it does mean he is the everlasting God, but it means more than that. And it is found in the very name of God that God revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Let's go there. Remember the story? Moses sees this bush that catches on fire on the side of the mountain. It catches on fire, but it's never consumed. It just keeps burning and burning and burning and burning. And so Moses turns aside to see this strange sight. How can a branch that's cut off and is on fire never be consumed? And so he goes to look at this bush that is burning but never consumed. And as he draws near to it, reading from the American Standard Version of 1901, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they will say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? You see, God Moses encountered God at that burning bush, and God said to him as he drew near, take your shoes from off your feet, for the ground upon which you stand is holy ground. And Moses draws near, and God utters to him his name. He is the God 
of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And I want you to go back into Egypt where my people are, and I want you to lead them forth back to this mountain where they shall serve God here on this mountain. And so Moses is inquiring of God, well, when I go to them and I say, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent me, and they ask, what's your name? What shall I say? And God, Elohim, said unto Moses, I am that I am. And you shall say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God said, moreover unto Moses, you shall say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh, the old translations was Jehovah, but that's not the correct pronunciation. It's Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. So go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared unto me saying, I've surely visited you and have seen what's being done to you in Egypt. And I have come down to rescue you. I've come down to deliver you from your bondage. And so Moses goes on the orders of God. But notice that God reveals his name. And when he reveals his name, he says, I am. What does that mean? Well, it means that God is the self-existent one. He is the one who has always lived. He's always has been. There's no beginning of God. He is the eternal one. He's the holy, eternal, mighty, almighty one. He is the I am, the one that has always been, the one who always will be, the one who is ever present, the one who has life within himself. He himself is the cause of all life that exists. He himself is life. In fact, the scripture uses very sparingly terms that apply to God, They says of God in the New Testament that God is life. God is light and God is holy and God is love. Now, in different ways, those terms have to be used, but they all have an eternal aspect to God. And some of them speak to God as being triune in his nature, but others speak to God as being this one eternal essence of God, the Almighty. He is the immortal one. He is in a condition that can never be improved because he is perfect. He is in a condition that can never decay because he is perfect, because he is holy, because he has always been, and in him is the fullness of life. He is the very fountain of life. Any life that exists has to have come forth from him. He is the only one that has by nature immortality. Sometimes he would speak in terms of, I live forever. Here's a a passage of scripture in which God makes a solemn vow. And he says in the International Standard Version, I solemnly swear to heaven. And I say, as certainly as I am alive and living forever, that I will do such and such. God is the one who has always lived, always living in the fullness of life. He is the self-existent one. He exists by virtue of his very being. And he shares his life with us in an act of grace and an act of almighty power when we are regenerated, when we are born again by the action of his Holy Spirit. But that does not make us immortal. It grants to us the gift of eternal life. But the gift of eternal life that we receive in this life now when we believe in God, in Jesus Christ, and call upon his name, it's an eternal life that begins now and that shall never end. But the immortal part in a derivative And a bestowed sense can only come at the resurrection of the dead. And that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll get to that maybe in a subsequent podcast. But today I want us to think about this reality that God is the immortal one. And we should avoid speaking of immortal souls. That's not true. It's only God who is the immortal one. 
the one who has always existed in the fullness of his being without any decay, without any imperfection, because he is the Holy One. He is the holy, righteous, unique God in all the universe. Here's some scriptures that express this great truth. And we should express the truth of God in confessions of faith to him, in our personal worship and in our corporate worship. Here, take to ourselves such a passage as Isaiah 55 and verse 57 in verse 15, in which this is the word of God. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Of the words of Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 10, but Yahweh is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. Truly, he is the immortal, the immortal holy one the ever-living, ever-existing, ever-holy, righteous one who inhabits eternity, but who in grace has condescended to make himself known to his creatures, especially his creature man that was originally made in his image, though that image has become shattered through sin. But God, the Holy One, sent Christ as the Savior because he is in the business of making that which was marred and that which has fallen and taking it up as a great treasure, a great treasure of grace in which he will bestow upon us eternal life through faith in Christ. It begins now and never ends. But also at the resurrection of the dead, he will grant to us a gift of immortal bodies we will be raised incorruptible in bodies like unto Christ's own glorious body after his resurrection from the dead. This has been Wayne Conrad with Bible Insights extolling the almighty immortal God.